that's not okay. Okay, here we go. Thank you. Um, the floor is yours. All right. <clears throat> well, thank you, Paul. And thank you everyone for joining us today. It's an honor to be here with you all and to be part of such an inspired international project. We're looking forward to the conversation today and, and to um, many further events. I'm David Porter. I'm a faculty member at the University of uh, Michigan in the English department. And I'm joined uh, on this session today by two of my Michigan colleagues, Melissa Duhame from the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology, and Kristen Haas from the Department of American Culture. Over the past several years, the three of us, along with a few other faculty colleagues and a sizable team of graduate students, some of you whom you see here, have been developing a place-based interdisciplinary research and engagement initiative called the Detroit River Story Lab. My thought is to spend the next 10 minutes or so providing an introductory overview of our work with a focus on the origins and goals of our initiative, our principal research methods, and our collaborative project areas. I'll then hand the mic over to Kristen and uh, Melissa, who will each provide more in-depth introductions to certain aspects of the project. So, high school students learn in history class, and I'm sure we all learn this as well, that across the world, rivers have always attracted human settlement. And the ancient and modern cities, in turn, have always depended on their rivers for sustenance and trade. But high school students are much less commonly taught, in my experience, the equally important truths that rivers have always inspired human storytelling and that the identities of communities that emerge along rivers' banks are often saturated with river-based narratives that shape, sustain, and inspire them. The Detroit River Story Lab emerged from our group's observations about how these relationships among rivers, the stories they inspire, and the communities they sustain have been playing out in our own particular region at this particular moment in our nation's history. At the regional level, we became increasingly aware over the past several years of the large number of community organizations, some of which are listed here, that were explicitly concerned and have been concerned for a long time with calling attention, calling public attention to the river stories. In particular, we found that there has been special interest among these local organizations in those often marginalized stories illustrating the river's centrality to the long local histories of indigenous settlement, anti-slavery resistance, immigration, labor movements, and environmental activism. At the same time, we became aware of the increasing visibility and contestation at the national level here in the US of the phenomenon of place-based story making or what we might call narrative infrastructure, especially in the narrative domains of journalism, education, and history. Over the past several years, as all of you know, concerns over narrative infrastructure in all three of these areas have attracted a great deal of attention and conflict as more and more people have come to recognize the critical importance to democracy and civil society of the place-based stories we tell about our communities and our nation. As traditional business models in the newspaper industry continue to collapse, as the academic freedom of teachers in US public schools continues to disappear, and as statues of slaveholders and Confederate generals continue to fall in city squares, Americans of every demographic and political orientation have come to a renewed appreciation of two critically important facts. First, that stories matter. And second, that investments in narrative infrastructure are every bit as important to 
in supporting the health and resilience of local communities as investments in roads, pipes, buildings. Inspired by these observations about an increasing commitment to community stories in our region and increasing awareness of the importance of narrative infrastructure at a broader scale, our faculty team created the Detroit River Story Lab in order to support river facing communities in their efforts to strengthen their narrative infrastructure, to expand public awareness of their rivers, richly layered stories, and to lay the groundwork for a more just and equitable future for the region. The research methods the Story Lab has used in pursuing these goals have fallen into three broad categories. In support of the storytelling goals of a variety of partners, we draw on archives and oral histories to document and elevate marginalized narratives grounded in community relationships with the river. At a more theoretical level, we develop conceptual frameworks to help us better understand how investment and disinvestment in narrative infrastructure impacts the health, resilience, and political empowerment of local communities. And at, in the active engagement space, we collaborate with organizational partners to prototype place-based approaches to supporting local educational and public history efforts. I mentioned earlier that the Story Lab has taken a special interest in three specific types of narrative infrastructure nonprofit community journalism, place-based education, and public history or, or community heritage. I'll use my remaining time to say just a few words about some of our ongoing efforts in each of these three areas. In the domain of community journalism, the lab has been supporting local place-based storytelling by offering internships and research support to nonprofit journalism organizations like um, Planet Detroit, which is a, a, a local environmental um, nonprofit news outlet. This is a uh, this is a, a picture of, um, of of Patricia Jewell, who's a graduate student who contributed a, a long form story about the river to this uh, paper. There, there are lots of other examples of this journalism on our website. But we've also supported our journalism partners by helping them develop robust, accessible training modules for aspiring community journalists in the city to build capacity for precisely this kind of place-based storytelling. In the domain of education, the Story Lab supports local place-based storytelling by providing high visibility platforms such as tall ship outings and boat building workshops high school students to showcase the river's rich cultural and environmental history. Um, in the right hand picture here, uh, you can see uh, Kimberly Simmons, one of our partners uh, who's been involved in um, world heritage efforts on the Detroit River, telling the story of the Underground Railroad and the river's importance in the Underground Railroad um, to a group of um, passengers on, the, on a schooner. In the third domain of public history, the Story Lab supports local place-based storytelling through collaborative work on site-specific interpretive installations. These storytelling platforms, whether physical or digital, can help to activate historically resonant sites that are part of riverfront parks, pathways, heritage destinations, and even transportation infrastructure, like the new Gordie Howe Bridge over the Detroit River between Windsor and Detroit. One of the Story Lab's newest projects in this public history space is the design of what we're calling a digital memory commons, specifically intended to support the collection, duration, and elevation of previously marginalized stories of Detroit River communities. The basic idea here is that the memory commons will function as a collaborative crowdsourced archive of river narratives organized along both chronological and geographical axes and accessible through a mobile interface that will invite visitors at riverfront sites not only to access site-specific stories in audio or video form, but also to engage themselves in meaningful ways with the natural and built features of a site um, that, are, that are referenced in these stories and even to contribute stories, images, and commemorations of their own 
through their phones to the shared memory commons archive so that these so their own stories too can then be accessed by future visitors to the site. The Digital Memory Commons project supports the longstanding efforts of a variety of municipal, regional, and even international partners to develop more flexible and inclusive approaches to interpretation and commemoration at local sites than our traditional reliance on marble statues and bronze plaques typically make possible. A prototype for the mobile interface was recently completed as a year-long senior capstone project by a student team here at the University of Michigan that gathered extensive community input on the project through public surveys and stakeholder interviews to guide their design of this, of this uh, new app um, in a way that is going to maximize um, user involvement and accessibility. Our hope for the app is it will eventually be adopted as a shared and ever-expanding resource, a collectively constructed memory commons by some of the many local organizations that are committed to building out place-based narrative infrastructure along the Detroit River Corridor. Um, so with that, I'll, 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 I'll stop and pass things over to um, Melissa. Hey, great. Thanks, David. So what, what will follow now, I will talk a bit about the place-based education, uh, educational development and, and focus. And then Kristen will, will follow up with the last two narrative project areas, community heritage and, and nonprofit journalism. So you can get a, a taste for how this, this looks in practice, um, in addition to the, the narrative, uh, kind of more the or infrastructure description of the, the narrative development. Okay, go ahead. So for place-based education, um, the process I'll describe, it, it's largely motivated or mo modeled after principles of community-based participatory research and practices of environmental justice movement. And I think you'll hear that as I reference um, the cycle of uh, identification of need and, and motivation as, and, and as well as the process and implementation of what we created in this space. So uh, the um, place-based experiential learning opportunities that we've been uh, developing for high school students in the district, um, in the districts adjoining the river have uh, taken the form of uh, tall ship outings, tall ship being what you're seeing in the slide here, and boat building workshops to invite these youth participants to connect with the river in different forms and uh, through different mechanisms and with its rich uh, cultural and environmental heritage. And so as I referenced at the start of this slide, this, this process is modeled on, you know, at the heart, community partnerships. And I'd say that's where we invested early and heavy, heavily um, and really took this kind of slow tact to preserve and respect the nature of human human relationship and partnership. And I think from, from my vantage, that has been the number one um, reason for, for any successes that we felt afterwards uh, or experienced afterwards in this project, that, that trust building has, has proven to be um, really central to all of the, the pieces that unfolded next. And so the starting first with these community partnerships, that then helps us to um, recognize the community identified needs within whatever realm we're um, helping to develop. And then what follows is this process of kind of co-design and co-creation of outcomes. And so in the realm of place-based education, um, we have things like uh, youth freshwater ecology immersion and boat building workshops and place-based environmental sciences curriculum for local schools as some of the outcomes of this uh, community-based uh, uh, um, process. And so you could go to the next slide, David. What I'll show now are, are some, some images of what this looks like. So here is an example of one of three of the 
um, week-long intensive boat building workshops that were held at both a maritime museum right on the bank of the river, as well as a, at a Black-owned marina on the river. If you go to the next slide, David, you can see more of the, the students in action um, building. So this is the skiff of the skiff and schooner project, building their boats. So they start at the, at the beginning of the week with, with wood and tools and, um, and some guidance from uh, professional boat builders that come on site to, to kind of take them through the process. And then the next slide, one thing I want to want to note, I mentioned that this the image that you're looking now is um, is in the on the on site at uh, Riverside Marina, which is um, owned by a Detroiter, Jason McGuire. McGuire and I uh, wanted to note the significance of um, this uh, event and and its location, in that uh, this is one of only eleven. Uh, black marina operators in the world. And so this really is a fantastic opportunity to um, kind of keep the ember glowing of the, the importance of, of this place and this space along the black, uh, along the um, Detroit River and kind of inspiring and, and sharing and holding this uh, maritime these maritime activities in the in the current uh, culture. And the next slide. And so here you see an image of the the, the participants uh, growing their newly built skiffs. And what you can see is that this demonstration of how really um, these activities can activate the Detroit River's potential to serve as these multi-purpose experiential learning classrooms and opportunity hubs for the local communities, and has offered the opportunity to recenter the Detroit River as a site of community identity and civic life. And really importantly, this last point calls to the series of um, community conversations that we had in 2021. And so again, that is a reference to that early uh, relationship building and community listening process. We had these community conversations with Detroit-based community leaders and elders, historians, activists, educators. And we were listening in these conversations as they recalled the Detroit of their childhoods and those of their parents and grandparents. And for, for me, and I think many of us, what we heard was, a longing for something lost. We heard that um, the bridge to what was lost was through their youth. And that really got me thinking about what role I could play in this as a science educator um, and looking for opportunities to uh, create this, these place-based educational experiences and curriculum development. And part of that bridge was bringing their kids, their youth back to the river. And, and that's you know, really caught me uh, when I saw these images. Like it's something is, is working, we're doing something here. And in some sense, bringing the kids back to the river physically, but also um, uh, 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 culturally, historically uh, in their knowledge of what has taken place in the river in the past. So we heard from teachers who, for instance, students grew up blocks from the river but hadn't touched its waters. And these were the types of narratives that early on inspired the series of place-based educational experiences. You can go to the next slide. And so we, we, we saw the skiffs and now we'll move into the schooner. So this, in total, the skiff and schooner program is hosted um, for uh, 26 river themed educational schooner sails on the Detroit River, is an example of which you, you, you see here. And this is in collaboration with the Inland Seas Education Association, which has a fleet of these tall ships that they dedicate to lake and water stewardship through education. Um, they're Michigan-based and they 
bring their the schooners down uh, to the Detroit River from their home harbor for these this programming. And so through, through this collaboration, over 650 uh, participants have had the opportunities to step on board these tall ships, hoist their sails, um, and as we saw, row the wooden skiff that they they built with their own hands, and then also participate in hands-on learning labs that are offered by community experts as well as the University of Michigan faculty, um, turning the the ship into a classroom. And some of the topics that that we've um, brought both. <clears throat> all, all three of us presenting have, have spent time on the boat and, and teaching in some form. We talked about topics ranging from principles of buoyancy to plastics pollution and climate change, as well as the resurgence of uh, the Great Lakes sturgeon, which is uh, a, just a phenomenally impressive type of fish that can grow. We want to be three to four meters long and, and live about 150 years. So that's like a very charismatic uh, species that can capture the interests of, of the student. Um, the different layered histories of, of the island and or, uh, the uh, river and surrounding shores and its centrality in the Underground Railroad and as a path to freedom for, for enslaved people, which we'll hear more about. So those are all topics of um, curriculum that um, we've both developed and shared, co-developed, and will um, preserve to be uh, passed on in future uh, educational experiences. You can go to the next slide. In addition, we <clears throat> had the opportunity to, to take um, some of the students on an even longer kind of extended three-day schooner sail camping on an island in the Great Lakes and participating in ship-based research and learning with alongside U University of Michigan students. And in a moment, uh, I'll share is a comment from one of the Detroit high school students that joined us for that trip. Uh, he was waist high in Lake Michigan under a star-filled sky and, and just said, wow. This is the kind of moment you remember for the rest of your life. And that was narrative in the making. So ultimately, I'd say the vision for this program, which is shared with the Detroit community leaders, is for uh, us, I think, for the University of Michigan presence to be decentered. And I think one of the strategies for this is, is training the next leaders from within the program. An example where I, I think we've already seen kind of some of this traction is this past summer, um, the Detroit River Story Lab supported an intern to, to train with the Inland Seas team and to gain uh, seamanship skills to be uh, one of the crew. Um, and, and, and when you're a crew on a ship like this, you are uh, directly participating in the, the education and the lake stewardship you're not just a crew, you're really core to the whole public facing team. It's a small, small boat. All right, the next slide. So the, the community educators and the youth leaders we spoke with, they expressed a need for place-based youth environmental education programming rooted in environmental justice and social equity and local and regional carbon economies and thereby the connection to um, climate change. Uh, and this is what, this is the call that we were answering in some of the sustained curriculum development. And in the next slide, you can see um, two of the graduate students that, that worked or are actively working with us on um, this type of uh, curricular modules uh, centered in, for instance, regional carbon economy. And so what you see here is the Detroit River Corridor Carbon Emissions Map. And so this is an interactive map that was developed um, by graduate student Gina Strada, you see pictured there, with, develop, uh, with teachers and educators in mind. And the idea was that it would be used as a, an instructional tool in classrooms. So here we have a tangible product that we can, um, that will sustain. Uh, and can be used 
by teachers in other in other learning settings for kind of this more hands on approach to understanding in this very place based focused um, framework major sources of greenhouse gas emissions right in the Detroit River corridor and where they're located. And so this now is is um, an example of a, a resource that can be used by other um, members of our curricular development team, like Alice Campbell and Darren Stockdale, also pictured here um, for <clears throat> education and curricular modules that can be brought into classrooms and um, and really anyone in the world could use this now. So on the next slide, <clears throat> closing up, but <clears throat> I wanted to summarize how the Story Lab has become a, a building ground for developing these sustained community relationships that have given rise to the new pedagogical approaches to answer some of these community recognized needs. And ultimately, as a model for how to use narrative building as tools of environmental stewardship. I'm going to close with a, a minute or two on the next slide. David, you can push. you can you can see that um, here uh, it's going to speak for itself. Go ahead and push play. Hopefully the sound is there sound? The sound is in I learned yeah, there we go. the Underground Railroad. I learned about like the plankton in the water and I learned about climate change. The Detroit River Story Lab is a new initiative at the University of Michigan that partners with local organizations to help local students reconnect with the river, to recognize the river as the source of their own local community's heritage, claim a sense of ownership in the river, and to find inspiration in the river and its stories for their own future educational and career pursuits. I didn't really think Detroit was all that special at all. I really thought it was just a regular place, nothing special, no history for real. But it's a lot of history to Detroit. They need this in the community. More kids need to be a part of it. None of these kids ever really built a boat before, and some of these kids have never really been on a boat before in their life. I wanted to get more kids in the city of Detroit interested in natural resources careers and also learning about the Detroit River and the waterway. The Detroit River is an important story uh, here in Detroit, and the kids, they live in Detroit, so they need to know about Detroit. You may have an interest in doing stuff um, as a career, working with the river, you know, create more opportunities for young folks like me. And that's how I'll we'll close. And so we can we can go ahead, David, to the next slide and, and pass it on to Kristen. Okay. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you. And I'm gonna um, first say so wonderful to be here. I'm going to be try and move kind of quickly so we have time for um, some sustained questions. I want to do two things kind of quickly. I do want to do, as Melissa said, talk about the other elements. So the three elements of our narrative infrastructure um, plan are place-based education, community heritage, and nonprofit journalism. And I want to talk briefly about community heritage and nonprofit journalism a little bit more, although we can talk about that in the Q&A. Uh, but I have this language here on the slide. This is our pathway for transformational resilience because I want to pause a little bit and talk about the context of the shape of our project because it's somewhat unusual. Um, David did a beautiful job of describing why narrative infrastructure matters. And um, we are all um, fully invested in that concept. Um, but in our location, 
there, there's a lot of context for understanding what might be this, our list in, in a way might make sense of these three elements, but it also might seem somewhat scattershot. So I want to give a little context for that. Next slide, David. Some regional context, right? The Detroit River is all of this water that you see north of um, the state of the city of Detroit, which you can see, um, David, could you just put the thank you, um, runs through the Detroit River. And the story of this place is a story of um, occupation, um, French, British, US occupation of native land. It's also a dramatic story of extraction. Detroit becomes Detroit, the Detroit River becomes important because of the natural resources that are available to be extracted along in, in this entire super rich, mineral rich and um, timber rich uh, area that you're looking at. Um, next slide, please. And that extraction enables the building of the city of Detroit. And, and the building of the city of Detroit is uh, the story of the, uh, of, um, the development of industry. The river that we talk about um, is fascinating in Detroit because it was built to be used by industry. Um, there are more parking garages still along and industrial sites along the rivers than parks by a dramatic factor, although partly we're trying to change that. Um, but Detroit is a city that it was built, boomed on extraction and then was really in a very brutal vice grip kind of way um, defined inequality in the United States defined inequality in racial terms in the United States. And this, if you're a US, US historian, this is a very familiar image. This is what we call a redlining map. But essentially what happened in Detroit happened in all other American cities, but it happened to Detroit on a very dramatic scale, which is that there were federal laws that were passed that limited acts, black access to real estate ownership or, um, and to, to good housing. So the redlined areas are areas that were uh, in which black people lived and um, in which you could not get a loan to buy a house. So to understand sort of the super rich, the tension between super resource rich river moving all of this material generating a, a global transformation in the economy, um, and, and at the center is this very tight um, mandated inequality. Uh, next slide, please. So in our region, we have the problem that our university helps the Detroit to death, that, that we have a long pattern of resource rich universities in the region coming in to help Detroit. And everything that we do in the service of the larger goals of thinking about climate change, sustainability, resilience, all of that has to be filtered through these uh, lenses because the, there is no answer for a better river, a better climate uh, in Detroit that involves outsiders coming in and telling Detroiters how to solve their problems. There is a blank slate problem. People from outside to tend to come in and see Detroit as a blank slate on which they can enact their experiments about whatever it is, climate change, sustainability. Um, so this project is, is unique in that, and, and all credit goes to David Porter, in that it is designed to lead from the back seat. Next slide, please. 
David has developed partnerships with people. Narrative infrastructure is something that we have identified as being the path forward for better relationships with the river, better stewardship of the river, broader steward, better broader stewardship of the regional environment. Um, but in order to do that in our context, not only did we have to identify um, narrative infrastructure as the key, but we had to take a back seat and really uh, understand ourselves profoundly as people who were enabling other people to tell their stories. We have all of these skills around storytelling and we understand the power of these narratives, but we also really understand that the stories that we need to tell are not our stories. They are the stories of the people who have been caught in that vice grip of inequality and disinvestment. So yielded a variety of collaborative work products and public events in support of local narrative infrastructure. That's our job. Next slide, please. And this language, investing in narrative infrastructure then means elevating and celebrating community stories, especially those traditionally marginalized and supporting projects that incorporate them into our understanding of places and our attachment to them, right? So again, just emphasizing the, the work that we are trying to do is support and raise up voices, um, not um, to create new narratives ourselves. Next slide, please. So, Melissa has talked about the shape that this took in the place-based education. Um, being mindful of time, I'm gonna be very quick about the community heritage piece and the nonprofit journalism piece. Next slide, please. These are a couple of images of um, Ed Dwight, who was the first African-American astronaut in the, in the United States. Um, his sculpture of um, commemorating the Underground Railroad. And for those of you who aren't familiar, um, the banks of the Detroit River was the terminus, the end of the Underground Railroad. The goal was to get from Louisiana through this horrible, arduous process to the site where this monument sits now and get across that river, which is into Canada. So we have been working with organizations who identified needs that we felt that we could speak to by helping them build narrative infrastructure. But we didn't start with, we think telling the story of the Underground Railroad is going to serve the larger mission, right? So we work with groups on the Underground Railroad because for them, understanding and teaching the history of the Underground Railroad, the way that it shaped the city of Detroit, politically, culturally, um, is an important part of raising up the relationship and the importance of the river in the history of the place. Um, next slide, please. We have also been working to develop, this is a, a community heritage resource map, identifying historic sites that are of value to people in the community um, and making, making the kinds of sites that they are broadly available. Um, David showed you what I think is a hilarious photograph uh, of the new bridge that's going to be built where he and I are working on some community heritage signage. But when, when you put up that image, David, I thought that's such a beautiful way to represent what we're up against. Because the that bridge in the image that David shows, looks like it goes from one lovely rural side of the river to another lovely rural side of the river. And in fact, it goes from, you know, the, the kind of pollution that had American rivers burning, you know, not that long ago, and dense population on one side to dense population and pollution on the other side. So the work of the community heritage is, right, telling the stories that are, mitigating against the fictions like like that was represented in that photo. Next slide, please. And this, um, if you can see along the riverbank, there is a concrete pathway. This is another, we have been working to um, 
add signage, develop the historical context for this river walk, which is an important um, project in Detroit that has been quite successful in returning people to the side of the river. Uh, next slide, please. And finally, just in the category of nonprofit journalism, this is the CEO, Danelle Wilkins of the Green Door Initiative and the young woman who David showed earlier, um, Patricia Jewell, uh, has written a couple stories about her. So the job is not to come in and for the University of Michigan student who's part of our partnership to um, tell about her research in the nonprofit journalism that she's doing. The job is for her to come in and lift up this woman who is a longtime activist. Detroit has a very rich history of environmental activism um, organized and carried out by African Americans in the city. And our contribution in this larger context can be to lift up her voice, um, to use our resources to help her be heard in a way that she might not otherwise be heard. So that was very abbreviated, um, but I want us to have time for questions, but I hope it gives you a sense of sort of why we are shaped in the way that we're shaped and a little bit of what these last two pieces of our project do. Next slide. And I think now we can open it up for questions. And I'm happy to talk more about, um, all of us would be about the, these last two elements, the community heritage and the nonprofit journalism, but I think better to open it up to questions now. Thank you very much to the Detroit River Story Lab team for a very inspirational uh, presentation. And uh, uh, I'd like to thank you for, for going first in our presentation series and also for this wonderful presentation, which I'm sure uh, will trigger a lot of uh, uh, comments, questions, feedback. So I'm going to stop the recording uh, now.